uh, ideally, from a scientific point of view, what we really want to try to do is understand what the underlying physical principles are that govern the folding, stability, and function of proteins. And uh, we want to use a design-based approach to this as opposed to a traditional uh, perturbation-based uh, paradigm. So typically, if you're interested in understanding how an enzyme works, for example, you might make mutations or perturbation in the active site and then measure what that perturbation does. Uh, using a design-based perturbation, what we're interested in uh, is to build a model, a physical model, a computational model of what the enzyme's supposed to do, how the protein's supposed to fold, and then do uh, designs in the context of that model, make new proteins, uh, measure them experimentally, and ask whether or not they work. If they work, then our model must be somewhat accurate. And if not, then we have to go back and refine the model. <clears throat> As a chemist, at the end of the day, uh, what we really want to do is make interesting stuff, uh, including things like engineered antibodies, biosensors, uh, uh, enzymes for biofuels, etc. So what I'd like to try to cover today is uh, outlined here. I'll do a brief introduction to the computational protein design. Uh, spend most of the time talking about computational enzyme design, some uh, published and unpublished work. And then if there's time, uh, talk about library design and uh, the production of enhanced uh, fluorescent proteins. Okay, so just so we're clear on what we're doing and not doing, uh, uh, the difference between full prediction and design. So here I'm showing uh, what full prediction is, you know, the sequence, and then we want to make some sort of prediction or calculation about what the structure might be. Uh, we can think of this as a mapping uh, from a point in sequence space to uh, some single point in structure space. So this is a very hard problem. Uh, lots of progress made recently, but still a uh, fairly difficult problem going from sequence to structure. What we're interested in is essentially the exact opposite problem, the inverse folding problem. That is, we want to start with a uh, structure and some function, uh, and then run a calculation to give uh, a, an optimal amino acid sequence. And so this is the inverse mapping. We're starting in structure space and doing the inverse mapping to find some sequence or set of sequences in sequence space, all of which will give rise to the uh, target structure. And of course, this is an easier problem uh, uh, simply because uh, the inverse mapping is highly degenerate. There are many, many sequences, all of which will give rise to the same target structure. So we can think of methods that may not be perfectly uh, uh, you know, exact and fully encompassing of all possible sequences, but as long as, as long as we land in the sequence subspace, we're going to be successful. And of course, we're interested in designing libraries of sequences that we can then use in experiments to do in a screen or a selection. And that's just, again, rather than specifying a single sequence, we want to specify a collection of sequences. So why do this computationally? Uh, it's, uh, I think, easy to demonstrate why uh, a computational approach is, is advantageous or can be advantageous. If you think about a single protein comprised of P residues of 20 naturally occurring amino acids, so they're on the order of 20 of the P different sequence combinations. And so even for small proteins or peptides, the number of sequences is, is uh, astronomically large. And so if you think about an experiment, uh, for example, for an 18 amino acid uh, peptide, there are 10 to 23 unique sequences. And if we chemically synthesize uh, one strand of each of the 10 to 23 possible sequences, it would require the mass of the baseball, which is almost tractable. But of course, even by the time you get to still very small proteins, you, uh, you're at the mass of the universe in terms of building a common coronal library that fully expresses that, that common coronal diversity. So computationally, however, we can address these numbers uh, uh, now quite, uh, quite easily. Uh, so over the years, we focused on uh, combination of methods and applications for computational design. Uh, uh, most computational protein design methods have these, uh, these elements in common. Uh, you start with a, some, some model of a protein backbone, either derived from the protein crystal structure database or, or some other, uh, or, uh, or from some other uh, uh, means uh, we use rotomer libraries to capture the conformational flexibility of amino acid side chains. So rotomer is just the an explicit conformation of amino acid, and we build these libraries by looking at the uh, structure database. Of course, our model includes uh, atom-based force fields that capture the the quote unquote physics of the problem. Uh, we use uh, common optimization methods to solve a combinatorial problem, and then of course. Uh, for many types of design, 
uh, negative design becomes important as well. Uh, that is, that's not always sufficient to do positive design, that is designing for what you want. Sometimes you also have to consider designing against the things you don't want, like aggregation, for example. So you can use these sort of methods then to uh, ask questions about the relationship of sequence structure and stability, think about evolution of protein structure and function, uh, make molecules that could be interesting. And so uh, uh, historically, we showed back in 97 that you can actually do this, and it really works. Uh, so what's shown here is a result where we took a zinc finger fold, which is shown in red, and uh, uh, stripped off all the side chains, uh, removed the requirement for zinc binding, and designed a novel sequence that experimentally folds to the target structure and that uh, back one fold is shown here in purple. And then to the extent that our force fields are somewhat accurate and, that, and also that if we're doing reasonable optimization, we should be able to design protein variants that are stabilized relative to their wild type counterparts, and we showed that back in 98, that you can take a, a mesophilic bacterial protein, uh, run these design calculations, and generate variants that are hyperthermostabilized relative to the wild type, and some that have both temperatures uh, well above 120 degrees Celsius. Okay, so how do we do the calculations? Let me just give you a quick um, uh, flavor for what the calculation really entails. Uh, here's our, our toy protein. We're going to do a calculation on two positions in the protein, P1 and P2. The first thing we have to do is specify uh, which uh, amino acids are allowed in each of the positions and which rotors of those amino acids we're going to include. So in this case, we're allowing both uh, the same set of amino acids and rotors for both positions. Uh, Allene has a single rotor or valine, uh, three rotors, and for this simple case, we're allowing three rotors for serine. Uh, and then we need to compute various types of energies. So the uh, 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 standard methods for computational protein design rely on the fact that you have at most uh, two body energy terms. And so we have one body, a one body term of self energy and then two body terms. So for the one body terms, uh, we compute the interaction energy between uh, some choice of amino acid in the rotor placed on the protein, the interaction energy between its atoms and the rest of the atoms in the protein, and we save that vector and of course we just do this for all <coughs> for all the single interactions uh, both first at P1 and then at the second position and then we just record these energies and the types of energy terms that we're evaluating include things like Van der Waals energy uh, to capture sterics uh, in most cases a simple uh, columbic energy for electrostatics and we can use more sophisticated uh, <coughs> electrostatic uh, Calculations like the saint Bolson, which are much more expensive and have other problems in the combined and composable. We have a hydrogen bond term and uh, a solvation term that captures the uh, hydrophobic effect and also the desire for polar amino acids to be um, um, surface exposed. So after we compute the one body energies, we have a two body term where we now compute all the pairs. Uh, in this case, the uh, uh, the backbone goes away because we've already uh, taken into account the interactions there, and now we're still looking at the interactions between the pairs of uh, rotors at the positions in the calculation. And of course, we run through the entire matrix and uh, store all of its energies. So at the end, we have uh, a, you know, a collection of two body and one body energies, and then the optimization is a simple uh, optimization, which is to find the choice of P1 and P2 that minimize the energy of the system. Uh, now, of course, in a real calculation, the number of choices that we would have at, at a position uh, would be on the order of perhaps thousands of different rotor combinations to cover the full computational flexibility of all the amino acids. So these uh, the matrix sizes here would be you know, many megabytes of data, and we can use you know, standard methods like Monte Carlo optimization to find solutions or more sophisticated methods, which I'll mention uh, very briefly. But in you know, a simple Monte Carlo optimization, we random, select a random initial position. So the second series rotomer for P1, the first failing rotomer for P2, here are the one body energies, here's the two body energy. And we sum them to get the energy and we make random moves uh, subject to the Metropolis uh, criterion for, uh, for progress. And in this simple case, we can find the ground state solution minus nine kcals for goal. And we can go back and build a model of. Uh, uh, you know, rotor number three of serine at P1 and rotor number two of serine at, at P3, or at P2. Okay, so it turns out for most cases, simple Monte Carlo optimization is not sufficient. 
and we spent a lot of time, and I won't talk about any of this in detail, looking at other optimization methods. Uh, for many years, we focused, focused on a method called dead end elimination, uh, which served us well, but more recently, we've been using a method called FASTER, uh, which stands for Fast and Accurate Sidechain Topology Energy Refinement. Uh, it's not my name, it's uh, the original. Uh, 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 authors are, uh, it's a group in Belgium that came up with the basic algorithm and we enhanced it for design purposes. In general, I would say that the, the computational component that is just doing the, the um, optimization for energy is a relatively solved problem using uh, the current versions of the faster algorithm. Then we limit ourselves to two body uh, uh, potential functions. Okay, so. Uh, I want to focus now on some applications, and in particular, thinking about enzyme design. So there are two types of um, uh, activities that I'll talk about. One is a simple ester hydrolysis reaction, and some published work, which I'll go through quickly. And then the other is uh, chemical elimination, which has been a focus of some, uh, uh, not only my group, but other groups in the area uh, over the last couple of years. Okay, so for uh, ester hydrolysis, we selected a simple system, uh, uh, parenteral phenyl acetate shown here as a substrate, and decided on the mechanism. Of course, if we want to design an enzyme, we have to have a mechanism that we're trying to target. Uh, there are uh, really two types of mechanisms for this hydrolysis that we can think about. Uh, one is a, uh, a nucleophilic attack on this, uh, 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 this carbon, uh, or a water-mediated uh, attack by where we pull up hydrogen on a water molecule and then hydroxide would attack the, uh, the substrate. So we select the nucleophilic attack, it goes through a hydrogen intermediate, uh, and which decomposes to release uh, first product, uh, and, and in this case, the acylated enzyme intermediate, which then goes through subsequent uh, hydrolysis to release the enzyme and then the other product acetate. So the way we model this in the calculation is to uh, uh, decide what we want for the nucleophile. So in this case, we select histidine. And then we just model the uh, some either transition state or high intermediate on this reaction pathway as a, a set of, uh, of rotors. So we're, in this case, we're modeling the high energy state. And we just model as a set of expanded rotors attached to um, uh, histidine. So then we, we run the calculation. If we place this histidine this modified histidine in various spots in the protein, we can ask, what are the other mutations that are required to stabilize the interaction of this system? Uh, and thereby build the active site for the protein. So we allow uh, the common uh, uh, rotations for histidine about, about chi1 and chi2, but of course we have to add now additional conformational flexibility to uh, account for the presence of the uh, substrate. So we can do that, and uh, it, we were able to uh, uh, find interesting uh, hits in a scaffold of a protein called thyroidoxin, thyroidoxin which doesn't catalyze its chemistry. Uh, here, panel A is shown. Uh, this is where the histidine is. Here's where the substrate lies in the model, computational model from the design calculation. Uh, we also get serendipitously a lysine residue that. Uh, uh, it sort of positions itself on top of the active site. Uh, here's what the surface looks like before the calculation. This is the wild type enzyme, or the wild type protein. And then uh, the, the triple mutation, which is surprisingly few mutations to introduce catalytic activity. Uh, so this leucine becomes the catalytic histidine, which is uh, here. And then these two aromatic amino acids uh, are mutated to uh, alanine to make room for substrate binding. Okay, so uh, experimentally, it actually works. Uh, it catalyzes the chemistry. So this is a Michaelis Menti plot showing um, uh, uh, initial velocity as a function of substrate concentration. And you get a classic uh, behavior uh, showing saturation at higher substrate concentrations. Uh, 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 despite the fact that it actually shows activity, the activity is not phenomenal. It's only about two orders of magnitude of rate acceleration. Uh, with a KM of roughly uh, you know, 170 micromolar. So the KM is not bad, the rate acceleration is uh, mediocre at best. Uh, but mechanistically, it actually works as, as we would expect. Uh, so here's some evidence to show that it, wor it works the way we, we want it to work. 
So at uh, some subject concentration, this is just uh, uh, product release as a function of time. So for our design molecule PCD2, we can see that we get uh, the expected result. We get initial burst phase and followed by a steady state phase. If you look at wild type thyrodoxin under the same conditions, it doesn't catalyze the reaction. We take our design protein and only, sorry, if we take wild type thyrodoxin and only introduce the uh, catalytic histidine, catalysis is uh, weak to non existent. If we take our design protein and knock out the catalytic histidine, it also turns off activity. So we require both the catalytic histidine and also the other active site mutations for uh, full activity. Because the reaction is actually quite slow, we can uh, uh, follow it by mass spec. And so the desired uh, mechanism includes an isolated enzyme intermediate, and we can see evidence for that uh, on this slide. So uh, here's the mass spec of the, uh, just the uh, enzyme by itself. We get a peak for the pair of protein. Uh, this is a MALDI experiment, and you often get a uh, copper matrix addict formed, and that's what this peak is. Uh, we add the substrate now uh, to the reaction, uh, run over to the mass spectrometer, throw it in. We see uh, the parent uh, protein, but we also see a peak come in at plus 42, which, which is the mass of isolation, exactly what we would expect uh, for the uh, isolate enzyme intermediate. Uh, here's the copper matrix <coughs> for the parent protein, and then we also see the copper matrix product for the uh, acylate enzyme. If we take the, the enzyme minus the catalytic histidine uh, and add uh, substrate, uh, we don't get uh, the acylate enzyme intermediate, we just get a noise level for the background. And so this, I think, demonstrates that uh, we're, we're operating by the desired mechanism of uh, going through uh, an acylate enzyme intermediate. Uh, furthermore, we can inhibit the, uh, the enzyme using a non hydrolyzable substrate analog shown here, and we get uh, sort of classic uh, 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 behavior in a double reciprocal plot where when you get an intersection on the y-axis, it's an indication of competitive inhibition, which suggests that this substrate binds competitively at the same active site. But the KI for the inhibition is weak, only 20 millivolar, but again, mechanistically, it, it does what we expect it to do. That was published a number of years ago. Uh, compared to early catalytic antibodies, uh, you know, it's sort of the same order of magnitude in terms of um, uh, rate acceleration and, uh, and KM. So we were uh, uh, pleased by that. We looked at a more complicated system to see if we could make more interesting enzymes using uh, more complicated chemistry. Before we did that, however, we wanted to do a modeling study just to see if we could recapitulate uh, more complicated binding interactions in known, uh, in known systems. So we looked at uh, uh, three different proteins, crystal mutase, uh, the binding of biotin and streptavidin, and then uh, uh, phytosphosphate isomerase. The idea here was that we would take an active site region, strip off all the side chains in the active site, and run our calculation to see if we could recover both the uh, active site uh, residue of amino acid identities uh, and the positioning of the uh, substrate, which is known for uh, by, by crystallography. And so in all, all three of these cases, we're able to uh, do a pretty good job of recapitulation. Uh, so in the mutase case, for example, uh, uh, there are, uh, there's a lysine, uh, there are two arginines and a glutamine that interact with the substrate, or this is actually a, a transistate analog. And we can recover not only the, the uh, sequence position of those amino acids, but also the confirmations to fairly high accuracy, as well as the positioning of the uh, transistate analog. And we do that for other cases as well. So we were actually quite pleased with that, and we set out then to look at a uh, more complicated reaction, although still a relatively simple reaction. In this case, it's the cap elimination. We're looking at um, uh, extracting this uh, hydrogen from uh, the substrate. It goes through a fairly simple uh, transition state uh, and, and goes irreversibly to product. And so the idea here is that we want to be able to take a, a protein that doesn't catalyze this chemistry and introduce a new active site that will uh, execute the chemical elimination. 
Okay, so we selected CAMP as a model system, uh, we and others, uh, because of, um, because we had a grant. Uh, uh, that, so, that's actually true. So there's, uh, so DARPA had a, uh, a grant program for doing model, uh, model uh, chemistry by computational design. And so my group with David Baker's lab and Homo Lay's lab with Duke and others around the country uh, were on a large grant program and we had a list of model reactions and Kemp was the first one. So we were all working on this. Uh, and so Kemp was the first one on the list because there was an existing Calic antibody from Don Hilbert's work when he was at Scripps, which had a fairly decent rate acceleration of uh, 10 to the 6. And subsequently there was a crystal structure of that Calic antibody and the haptin used to elicit the antibody. And that's shown here. And so what you can see is that the, uh, the, where the substrate lie is sandwiched in by aromatic interactions. And then the catalytic uh, glutamate is locked in with other, by other polar interactions in the protein. And so uh, if this were the real substrate, this, uh, this interaction then would be the catalytic contact. Uh, in addition, uh, Ken Halk at UCLA had uh, previously uh, computed a uh, transition state uh, model by initio methods uh, for this reaction. And so we could combine then the uh, uh, sort of quantum, chem quantum chemical uh, notion of what the chemistry should be, capture the transition state, and with the, uh, we'll learn from uh, the crystallography about how the what the active site should look like, and then build a, a new protein that sort of does all of this stuff. And so in our active site design, what we want that is to um, allow for uh, some general base, either asp or glue, uh, ideally with other interactions that tie down the position of the, uh, of the catalytic unit, and ho hopefully also modulate the PKA. Here's the substrate, and we want to uh, position the substrate in, in an active site where we can uh, have at least uh, one uh, uh, base stacking interaction. And then most ideally, uh, even though it's not present in the calic antibody, we'd love to be able to uh, put a hydrogen bond on this oxygen because in the transition state, this oxygen develops negative charge. Uh, and so we'd like to be able to stabilize that in the hydrogen bond. Okay, so we uh, pushed the button in our program, got lots of hits on lots of scaffolds, and made lots of molecules, and uh, and burned out lots of grad students, uh, and none of these worked. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, some of them look beautiful, so here's one. These are all models based on the calculation. Uh, you know, here we have the substrate perfectly sandwiched between two phenylalanines with the uh, catalytic, uh, can't tell if that's an asp or a glue, uh, perfectly positioned to pull off this hydrogen. And there are many designs that look that nice, but uh, none of them actually work. In fact, the typical data uh, that we've got is shown here. Uh, background reaction shown in black. This uh, is at some uh, substrate concentration, uh, as a function of substrate concentration, uh, initial velocity. Uh, uh, one of our designs, 16.3.1, uh, is even slightly worse than background, uh, which is not good. Uh, the scaffold, of course, doesn't uh, catalyze the reaction at all. It turns out that just serendipitously, BSA, BSA does everything. Uh, BSA catalyzes the reaction weekly, so our designs weren't even as good as some random protein that I'm supposed to do this chemistry. So we were quite discouraged and uh, uh, really wanted to figure out what was going on. And so we decided to um, go back and look at one of our, our best designs and analyze it much more closely and see if we could learn anything from it. So our, our best design uh, was called HD1, so it doesn't work. Here's what it looks like, though. Uh, here's the substrate. Again, this is just a model. Uh, here's the catalytic unit, uh, beautifully tied down by hydrogen bonds. Uh, we get uh, a tyrosine that makes the hydrogen bond to this oxygen that's going to develop negative charge in the transition state. The beautiful uh, stacking uh, with this tryptophan. And importantly, this hydrogen bond network, here's the catalytic uh, glutamate, it goes through this histidine. Uh, this asparagine and to this tryptophan, so the tryptophan is even held in position uh, uh, properly to help the substrate get in and make the appropriate catalytic contact. So we know the molecule is folded. Uh, we can tell that by CD. We saw the structure. 
by crystallography. And this is the crystal structure uh, where this, this is the this is a model where the substrate should be. So everything else is real except the uh, uh, substrate. And so what we, what we observe from the crystal structure is that uh, uh, the active site is too exposed. That there was uh, much there was way too much ordered water in the active site. And that's a problem for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, uh, you know of course removing ordered water from the active site would give you a, a, an entropy head in terms of the uh, activation entropy for the, for the reaction. But in addition, uh, the, the catalytic, uh, the presumptive catalytic unit, which is sort of shown in the back here, is almost completely solvated. So the pKa is not going to be appropriately shifted. So in order for this chemistry to go, uh, we want to shift the pKa of the, uh, the spark of the glutamate up a little bit so that it's more, more active. But if it's fully solvated, the pKa is going to be four, four and a half, just like it would be for regular for regular glutamate. So active site too too exposed. Uh, in addition, uh, this is a comparison between the uh, X-ray and purple in our design. Again, the position of the substrate is, is just the model. Uh, in our design, of course, I pointed out this beautiful hydrogen bond network that goes to the tryptophan. Uh, this is the design in this gray. But in reality, what we see is that we get great positioning of the uh, uh, glutamate, hydrogen bond to the histidine, but the asparagine rotates 90 degrees and, and does not form this hydrogen bond to the tryptophan. And so what happens then is the tryptophan actually rotates out of the active site, uh, effectively disrupting the binding interaction energy that we would expect to have if things were oriented properly. So we have this, uh, the pi stacking is not quite so <coughs> And the third thing we looked at in collaboration with Ken House Lab at UCLA is uh, MD analysis. And so uh, here's a summary of the MD simulation. And what we're doing here is we're tracking the, uh, the catalytic contact between the hydrogen on the substrate and the uh, oxygen on this, uh, this glutamate. And so as the, as the simulation starts, uh, this is the, uh, that contact distance is a function of time. Of course, we want it to be catalytic competent, so three extras or less. Oh, initially, the contact is maintained, but fairly soon in the simulation, it jumps to a state where um, uh, the distance is uh, way non-catalytic. So if you look at this as a histogram, we can see that uh, the desired catalytic contact is here at the green bar, but much of the simulation will way out here at uh, distances that are clearly not going to be catalytic. And we can see what happens uh, in, in the simulation as uh, 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 shown here. So here's the substrate. Here's the catalytic glutamate. Initially, it's, it's contacting appropriately, but as the stimulation progresses, what you'll see is that the substrate flips over and moves out of the active site, and the active site uh, becomes filled with water, and the, uh, as we saw in the crystal structure, the uh, glutamate uh, becomes much more solvated than desired. And so, of course, now the, the distance between the hydrogen and the glutamate is, is way non-catalytic. It's rotated 180 degrees away from where it needs to be. So based on that, we were able to think about what we needed for a second generation design. We wanted a, a deeper active site. Uh, everything else still looked good uh, in terms of the catalytic units. We still wanted the base stacking. We still wanted this hydrogen bond uh, uh, donor to the oxygen. So here's a uh, here's a new active site, same scaffold, but now uh, pushed deeper into the protein. Here's the substrate. Uh, here's now rather than glutamate, we have the spartic acid that's going to function as a catalytic uh, unit. Here's a th uh, threonine that makes a hydrogen bond uh, to the oxygen on the substrate, and then we have uh, base stacking with this uh, tryptophan. And we also get serendipitously a wild type lysine that makes a contact to the nitro group on the substrate. So we can repatent the active site, it's a 12-fold mutation uh, from wild type. We repeat the MD simulation. Uh, what we see is that we still get two states of, uh, uh, two different conformational states, but they're now both catalytically competent. So the design has uh, the contact here, here's the aspartic acid, here's the substrate, here's the hydrogen. In state one, the substrate slides around a little bit. And, uh, but we still maintain catalytic contact. It quickly flips over to a second state where you can see the substrate is sort of slid down in the active site. But the contact is maintained. <coughs> and 
and water has not penetrated the active site, giving us hope that the pKa of the aspartic acid will, will be appropriate for the chemistry. You look at the, uh, the histogram for the distance distribution, and that looks great relative to what we saw before, sharply peaked at the catalytic contact. So if we make the molecule, as shown here, as we make it, express it, purify it, here's some uh, purified material. Uh, we can uh, show by CD that it's folded. Uh, compared to wild type, it's 20 degrees uh, destabilized, but it's still well folded. Uh, with, a, with an apparent TM uh, well above uh, where we're doing our actual uh, chemistry. Uh, the actual uh, wild type protein is, is hypothermophilic, and which is, was on purpose because we knew that introducing a large number of mutations would destabilize it, uh, which it does. We have crystals we'll come back to in a minute. Uh, so experimentally, then, it actually works. It catalyzes the chemistry. So here's uh, HG2, uh, Michaelis Venn plot. It does, does not show saturation. Um, uh, we have more variants later that I'll show you that do show saturation. But relative to the background, <coughs> just underneath here, and the wild type scaffold uh, shows no uh, activity. Uh, our second generation design is active. Even though it doesn't turn over, we still fit it. Uh, this is not good for students, you shouldn't do this. Uh, uh, but again, anyway, just to get a rough idea of what the KM is, uh, you know, weak KM, 12 millimolar, and a uh, KCAT, uh, which is not that great. Uh, uh, but it actually works. And so if we look at knockout stat, so we take our design, HG2, which is shown here in blue. Uh, if we uh, uh, remove the catalytic, uh, aspartic, acid, aspartic acid and mutate it to an asparagine, it turns the enzyme off. If we remove the uh, hydrogen bond interaction to the oxygen that's supposed to be developed, it's the oxygen that's, that's developing a negative charge in the transition state, it slows the enzyme down. And then if we compare our design, HD2, to uh, K70, which is a design from the Baker lab that was published about a year ago, uh, we can see that ours is better. I'll let them work first. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of numbers, then um, uh, we're getting a rate acceleration of roughly 10 to the 4, which compares favorably uh, to uh, a Baker Lab design uh, that was published, uh, as I mentioned, about a year ago. And so, given this uh, encouragement, then we uh, sought to further understand what's happening in HG2, and in particular to see if, uh, which had not been demonstrated in any previous case, whether or not a transition state analog was actually binding to the correct uh, active site. Okay, so this is a real structure of a transition state analog uh, in the active site, and we can see several interesting things. Uh, first, and probably the most important feature is that, uh, even though this contact distance is kind of tight, uh, the uh, substrate is interacting with the presumptive catalytic aspartic acid. In addition, the substrate is uh, stacking on this aromatic amino acid as designed, but interestingly, uh, the substrate is flipped over roughly 180 degrees from where it should be. So in our design, this nitro group should be way over here interacting with this lysine. It's not, it's actually now flipped over. And rather than this, this is a design searing position, Rather than the serine interacting with uh, what would be the oxygen on this side of the uh, uh, substrate, it's now interacting with the nitro group. So uh, the great news is that uh, we have now for the first time a co-crystal structure of a designed enzyme with a substrate analog in the active site showing the, the critical contact. Bad news is that, uh, which may be consistent with the, the low activity, is that the detail of the structure indicates that uh, the design is not doing exactly what we want, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's, we get a critical interaction, but we're not getting other interactions that we uh, would have liked to have had uh, as part of the design. Okay, so then based on this, and uh, the fact in particular that the serine is not interacting uh, with the oxygen that would be in the real substrate, we uh, went and did a third generation design that, uh, uh, modulate this position somewhat to fill a, uh, uh, a void space that, that we see in some of the MD simulations. 
we, we uh, re ran the MD simulation on this third generation design. This is now a point mutation of our active design. Uh, it's serum to threonine, so just adds a methyl group. The MD simulation looks great. And then we made this molecule and uh, assayed its activity. And um, uh, third generation molecule is much better behaved. It shows, it starts to show, uh, starts to show saturation behavior as desired. It would tell us the plot. And as you can see, it's much more active than our previous design or other, other, uh, other designs that uh, were, uh, were published. Okay, so in terms of rate acceleration then, for our third generation design, uh, we're almost at 10 to the 6. Uh, in fact, uh, if we uh, uh, share this molecule with another lab, with the Hilbert lab at uh, the FAH, uh, who do uh, who are enzymologists, uh, we're just sort of hack enzymologists, they, they show that in a appropriate buffer system that they can get rate acceleration of 10 to 6, which maps the catalytic antibody. So this is the, the uh, in terms of rate acceleration, the best uh, design enzyme that's been uh, described today. And so one interesting thing I want to point out is that if any of you are familiar with the computational approach the design field, there's been a lot of controversy recently uh, around computational enzyme design. And there's a, an important paper that was attracted uh, from science um, uh, about a year ago, and so uh, there's, there's now, not my lab, of course, uh, uh, there's now a real effort to bring collaborators in to corroborate um, designs. So what we did in this case was to uh, send a clone to the Hilbert lab and Rebecca Bloomberg, a graduate student in Don's lab, uh, using a different purification scheme than we used, uh, getting much cleaner material, was able to show that the enzyme does exactly what we expect it to do. Uh, and has uh, kinetic properties that are consistent with our data, if, if not slightly better. Uh, and now they're also uh, in the process of using uh, direct evolution methods to see if they can improve the, uh, improve the molecule. Okay, so uh, uh, summary to this part of the talk is that, uh, you know, you can really do this. You can use computational design to design novel enzymatic systems. Uh, uh, I think we're still at very early stages, um, uh, but you know, in terms of introducing novel activity, uh, nothing else really works. You can't really do direct evolution to introduce novel activity. You can use direct evolution very effectively to increase activity in the existing enzyme, but to introduce novel activity, uh, this looks like it might be an interesting way to go. Uh, I didn't show you a lot of data. Uh, there's a paper that's coming out hopefully soon uh, that will show more data. Uh, one thing that we found surprising, at least I found surprising, was that uh, the MD analysis uh, was amazingly predictive. So we have a whole panel of molecules that we designed where we did blind studies uh, at UCLA in, uh, 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 where they ran the MD simulations and then told us which ones would work and which ones wouldn't work. And roughly 80% of the time the prediction was correct. Uh, that Things they said wouldn't work based on the MD simulation didn't work experimentally, but the things that they predicted would work based on the MD simulation did in fact work experimentally. And so I was actually really amazed at uh, a simple MD simulation. Of course, if you notice, these MD simulations weren't very long. Uh, and of course, they don't do, there's no chemistry happening here. There's no, this is not a QMM calculation, it's a pure mechanics calculation. Uh, where the only thing that's being evaluated is whether the substrate stays in the active site in a catalytically competent or, uh, orientation. So that was actually really nice and, and uh, potentially very useful going forward uh, for screening perhaps you know, many thousands of designs and only going into the laboratory with those designs that uh, are predicted to be uh, active. Okay, of course we're interested in trying to do real stuff with this and uh, uh, in fact, uh, 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 I started a company last year with Monsanto to look at engineered enzymes for ag biotech applications using this kind of methodology. But we haven't resolved yet. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, library design. Uh, I'll, we'll just only go through the first two pieces and not have time for the, <coughs> for the third component. So we're just in. Um, uh, coming up with methods for designing libraries, computation designing libraries, and then uh, validating them, and then I'll show an application where we 
uh, a published application where we made an, an enhanced blue fluorescent protein. And we're also, the thing that we're really interested in is making enhanced red fluorescent proteins that are, that are red shifted relative to what's available now, which would be much more useful for imaging, um, imaging applications. Okay, so uh, what we're interested in terms of library design is to generate uh, new and improved protein function by screening common for alignments proteins that contain a high fraction of functional molecules displaying a wide range of functional diversity. So uh, uh, the problem is that in terms of library design, thinking about methods like parachrome PCR and uh, recombination experiments, uh, the problem is that the issue of preserving function, so uh, you have some wild type function that's maybe enzymatic activity, you make a library of many different molecules, you'd like all the members of that library to have some functional activity. So you want to preserve functional activity. <coughs> At the same time, uh, you'd like the um, uh, library to show a diversity of function. If everything looks exactly like the parent protein, then you haven't done anything. So you want high preservation of function, but also high diversity of function. And of course, these things are anti-correlated. If you, uh, uh, in a PCR experiment, aerosol PCR experiment, for example, if you want to get high diversity of function, you might use a very high mutation rate. Uh, now that, unfortunately, will give you typically a low preservation of function because the more you mutate the protein, the more likely you are to destroy all of the function. And conversely, if you want to preserve the function, you might use a low mutation rate, uh, so you'll get high preservation of function, but of course, low mutations I mean you're not changing the, the parent protein at all, and you're going to get low diversity of function. So of course, what we want to do is uh, use computation to uh, optimize both properties, both diversity of function and preservation of function. That is, we want to uh, have calculation allow us to use a high mutation rate, but then to show us where the protein these mutations can go. Uh, now the problem is that, uh, uh, and I didn't point this out in the, previous talk, in the previous part of the talk, when we think about functional properties of proteins, like an enzymatic reaction, our design calculation is actually not really doing the chemistry. There's no QM in that, uh, uh, in that calculation. So what we're relying on is a, um, a, a, a hypothesis that basically says that if the protein is folded and stable, then it increases the probability that it's going to be functional. And clearly the opposite of that must be true. The protein's not folded and stable, it's not going to be functional. So our hypothesis is folded for function, so we're going to uh, stabilize, uh, compute fold stability as a surrogate for understanding what the real function is. So the way we do this is shown here. So in our normal calculation, uh, we have a structure, we have a pairwise proposal scoring function, we have energy, we have an optimization, and we get something at the end. So for, for the calculation I showed you before, we have two types of energies, uh, this one body energy and a two body energy, we run our pair energies, and then we run our optimization, we get a sequence out. So for a library, we're gonna do the same thing, but just manipulate the energies. So we, we convert our uh, one body energies, instead of being focused on amino, a, a single rotor, we, we aggregate them into amino acid single energies, amino acid one body energies, and then amino acid pair energies. And then we can apply these set constraints to get set energy, you know, a set one body energy and a set uh, two body energy. And the sets are just the uh, collections of amino acids that are encoded by degenerate codons. So if you uh, use a degenerate, different degenerate codons, we'll code for different sets of amino acids. And we can put all that together to then get a, uh, a calculation that where the output is now a library, it's a sequence of degenerate codons that codes for different combinations of amino acids at each position. Then we can go into the laboratory and make that gene and then as the expression for our library. So it's identical calculation, but now we're adding these additional constraints for degenerate codons. All right, so to test it, um, uh, we look at GFP. Uh, we're going to target 15 core positions in GFP, shown here in yellow, ex excluding the chrome core, which is shown here in green. Uh, we're going to score uh, using fluorescence on a plate reader, and we're going to score preservation of function as the integrated fluorescence intensity, so the function of the protein is the fluoresce, and we're going to score diversity of function 
as the uh, uh, peak position for the fluorescence, fluorescence maximum. Okay, so there are different libraries that we're going to compare. So this method I just mentioned is called DBIS, which is a silly name, but there, we have two different versions of it that I'm using here. One where we constrain the system to select two-fold degenerate codons at nine positions out of the 15 uh, in this region. Another setting where we, so this is a very high mutation rate, we're going to mutate nine positions out of 15, which is kind of crazy. Uh, a less aggressive <coughs> implementation where we're going to use four full degenerate codons at four positions. So now we're only using four positions out of 15. And then a, a mean field based approach that we published many years ago where the calculation <coughs> uh, targets the two positions that have the, uh, uh, that are most likely to be tolerant to mutations. So we go from very high mutation rate to moderate to low mutation rate. And then a random library where we uh, uh, use two fold degenerate codons at the same <coughs> at the same line positions. <coughs> at the same line position we identify this calculation. So we don't do a truly random because truly random would be we would just get garbage. And we have an error point PCR control uh, directed at the entire gene, the entire protein. Uh, uh, again, because if we just did an error from PCR targeting at this tight region, we would get too many mutations and we'd get garbage out. So these are, uh, they're good random controls, but they're, they're, um, they're biased to be better than what you would expect if you did it really properly. Importantly, because we're doing this computationally, we can constrain the libraries so that uh, we always maintain the wealth of amino acid at each position in the library. <coughs> Okay, so here are the different libraries, here are the positions, here are the different calculations. Uh, and you can see here for the highest mutation rate, uh, we have these two fold degenerate codons. So we have a proline and aline, a threonine and a serine, a valine and a uh, at, at nine positions selected by the calculation. Uh, so the two fold, and of course we preserve the wealth of amino acid in, in black. Uh, the uh, fourfold library so targets four positions and, and uses fourfold degenerate codons, but also maintaining the wealth of amino acid. The mean field calculation, which does saturation mutagenesis at two positions that are most able to accommodate mutation, and then the random control, same line positions, but now a random selection of a two-fold degenerate codon that contains the wealth of amino acid. Okay, so then. Um, uh, uh, we can score these by preservation of function. So these are ordered by average mutation rate, so very high, medium, low, random control, and then near chrome PCR control for the entire gene. These are the number, number of clones that were sampled. These are experimental data. Uh, uh, you can see that we get good preservation of function despite the fact that we're using an amazingly high mutation rate. Remember, this is over a stretch of 15 amino acids. So 12% uh, of the clones have at least half of the presence intensity of wild type, and almost half of the clones have uh, at least 1 50th the fluorescence intensity of wild type. So if we now have to look at the other libraries that have lower mutation rate, we get the counterintuitive result, which is that the lower mutation rate has lower preservation of function, which is exactly the opposite of what we would have expected, but exactly what we want from the calculation. We want the calculation to allow us to use a high mutation rate and get high preservation of function. And this, this sort of counterintuitive thing is explained out here. I won't read it. Uh, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, but we get the, the desired counterintuitive effect of high mutation rate gives high preservation of function. If you look at the random control. It obviously does terribly, as we would expect. And the error prone PCR control, uh, using this mutation rate targeted against the entire 300 amino acid protein, does exactly what we expect. That is, we're, we're mutating it lightly and we get high preservation of function. And you'll see on the next slide that this is that because of this, we get low diversity of function. Okay, so we look at diversity of function now. So only those clones that have at least half the intensity of wild type, uh, again, rank ordered by, or ordered by um, mutation rate. So what I'm showing here then is for the highest mutation rate, uh, this is uh, peak position deviation from wild type in nanometers. So zero would be identical to wild type. The uh, white bar here is the median peak position 
The red bar is plus and minus 25% of the data, and the black tick marks are the actual data. So for the high mutation rate, we get the expected result, high mutation rate, high inversion view function, almost a uh, uniform distribution of uh, peak position uh, across this interval. As expected, the lower mutation rate uh, approaches give lower diversity of function. So they're all you know, targeted, they're all sort of right on top of where you expect wild type to be. The random control, uh, same thing. And the airframe PCR control, as I showed in the last slide, uh, despite the fact that it had, I mean, it, it had high preservation of function because we're using a relatively low mutation rate, it also has very low diversity of function. So all the data are right on top of zero. So we're not changing the fluorescent property of the protein. Okay, so uh, we can preserve function, uh, we get diversity of function because we can have the calculation tell us where to put the mutations, and it sort of corroborates our idea that if designing a library based on full stability is a good surrogate for the actual chemical function of the molecule. This was published a couple years ago, and one quick example of using this for something that might apply something that might be useful is looking at blue, uh, blue fluorescent protein. Um, so here's the blue fluorescent protein, here's the chromophore, here's the residues that are around the chromophore. Um, uh, so BFP has you know, a, a blue shifted admissions maximum, which is useful for doing cell biology experiments if you want to do imaging. Um, the problem with BFP uh, as it exists is that it has a very poor quantum yield, which means it's very dim. Uh, it's very pH sensitive, and most importantly, it, it, it photo bleaches very rapidly. So you hit it in light and it just goes away. So we designed a library using this method that targets 12 positions around the chromophore. Uh, uh, if you do site saturation unit at all 12 positions simultaneously, you would have 10 to the 15 different variants, which is intractable experimentally. The calculation reduced the number of variants to a, a focus common for a library of 10 to the fifth variants, and we can screen those conveniently using uh, facts. Of the rest of the activated cell suit. So here's the design, here are the positions, here are the wild amino acids, here are the, uh, the uh, wild type codons, here are the, the, the generic codons that the calculation pulled out, and here are the amino acids that correspond to these degenerate codons. And you can see that the, uh, the uh, uh, some positions are wild type, some positions have lots of mutations, they're spread across the, uh, this whole cluster of, of positions in the protein. So a very non-trivial construction for the library. Uh, in a single pass of facts analysis, we can sc uh, screen that library and pull out a clone, which is a triple mutant from wild type, uh, uh, shown here. And it has the following properties. Uh, again, this is a single pass uh, through the screen. We enhance the palm yield from 0.34 to 0.55, which is actually pretty remarkable. And we get a 40-fold improvement in photo bleaching half-life. So here's uh, wild type PFP, which has a short half-life. Here's our uh, design variant called Azurite, which has a much enhanced half-life. And looking at that in real cells, so these are mammalian cells. Here's BFP as a function of time. You can barely see it, it's very dim because of the, the uh, uh, poor particle meal. And of course, it gets dimmer because of photo bleaching over time. Here's our variant, very bright at time zero, and maintains brightness even at uh, longer time scales. So this is, I think, a great demonstration of uh, designing a library with some target function uh, where you cannot compute the function, we can't compute the fluorescent properties uh, in these calculations, but in a single pass getting a molecule which is great. Okay, I'm going to skip all this other stuff. Um. Okay, and this acknowledge for the work. Uh, the unpublished and undesigned work uh, was done primarily by Heidi Privet, who was a graduate student in the lab, and uh, everything else was published. And I'll uh, also want to acknowledge that uh, in Kent House Lab, uh, Kirk Kiss, a graduate student, uh, was responsible for all the MD simulations. And then the structure stuff that we do is in collaboration with uh, a facility at Caltech called the Electric Observatory, uh, which includes a, a beam line at Stanford and uh, uh, Len Thomas and Pavle um, were critical in helping us do this live. Thank you.